And Joe, if I can take you back to um, when you wrote the book in the first place, what was the, uh, I mean, can you remember coming up with the inspiration, what was coming up with the idea of the story? And did you, and when you came up with the idea of the title, did you sort of give yourself the rest of the day off? <laughs> Yeah, you know, so the title is his vanity license plate, and there were some arguments actually initially with my publisher about whether that would fly, and we discussed other possible titles, but I, I wanted to stick with it. I felt like it was cool because, because I think when you look at it, you don't instantly know what it means, and because it doesn't make sense, you're sort of drawn to it. Um, it's something to puzzle out. And anything that gets you to spend a moment longer with the book increases the possibility that it will intrigue you and you'll wanna you wanna open the cover and start reading. So I kind of like the puzzle-like nature of the title. As far as the genesis of the story, I mean, I can't remember any one moment when I thought, okay, this is the whole thing. Um, uh, I know that I hate Christmas music, especially in October. You know, when it's just too early, and it's weird the way that the you know the chipmunk song invades your life every fall, and that feels evil. Well, there, I think there's, there's a saying that I uh, read the other day that anyone who likes Christmas music has never worked retail. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think part of the job of horror is to find things that we love and trust, that, that we find reassuring, and then kind of rip the carpet out from under them. Um, Lon Chaney has this great line, he said, there's nothing funny about a clown at midnight. You know, and I, I think, you know, Christmas music is fine on December 24th, but if it's the middle of a hot summer and you're lost in the woods and you come across an old ramshackle shack with boards over the windows and you hear Christmas music coming from inside, you run the other way about as fast as you can go. And Jamie, I describe your approach to this as, as faithful but not to a fault, as it were, that, that you very much um, watching the, the, I had the pleasure of watching this a couple of weeks ago, and watching it again, and I've recently reread the book, and I was struck by how much of the book is in the film, is in the, the TV show, but at the same time, you clearly haven't, um, you've clearly rearranged, particularly with the character, the, the central character, you've rearranged that. Maybe, I, mean, I don't know if everybody's read the book yet, but maybe you could talk a little bit about the differences between, um, especially with regards to that character, the book and the show, and why you felt the need to change that. Sure. of the book. I actually hadn't read it when, um, yet when AMC came to me and asked me if I had read it, but I had read Lock and Key and was a big fan of Joe's. Um, so I was like, nope, but I'm happy to try it. And so that was like a Friday. I read it over the weekend and just instantly loved it. So um, my task, the way that I saw my task was to to the book as I possibly could while still making a television show. Um, you know, one of the main differences, uh, like right off the bat, is that when we meet Vic McQueen in the book, I think she's about eight years old, and that's the first time she encounters her bridge. And, you know, one thought, I, the, the whole story of that first, like, third of the book, Vic is a kid, um, and it's also really compelling. Um, dramatic and I wanted to show every moment of it. That said, I knew that we were going to cast an adult actor um, and so I thought let's just say that maybe Vic gets her powers. You know, Maggie has a line in the next episode where she says it's a little like puberty. Um, it hits people kind of at different times. Uh, and so I, I, I thought let's give ourselves a little leeway on the age of Vic so that we can actually tell more of the story. Uh, and not miss out on all that really juicy stuff in the beginning when she first meets Megs. And actually, this is this is very much your character's story. What was? How did you get involved? What was it like to when you first read the script? 
Uh, well, I originally, I didn't actually receive a script when I got the audition. Usually you get a little log line, a couple of sentences summarizing the entire series um, and a brief character description. So uh, I went to the source material, Joe's wondrous book, um, and yeah, that was what really kind of hooked me in. I think the complexity of characters, the multi tiered themes, metaphors that exist through this really accessible lens, which is the horror genre, alongside this kind of gritty family drama was something that really drew me in, and then um, such an incredibly powerful female lead. Uh, yeah, that was, it was kind of a no-brainer, especially after I spoke to Jamie and heard her enthusiasm and thoughts. Um, <laughs> and I think he shows tremendous promise. <laughs> that he'll stay with it. Um, Can you help him get a publishing deal? <laughs> I know what ain't it. The, um, uh, no, I've written a couple short stories with my dad, you know, uh, and, and both times the experience was like, you ever see any of these Roadrunner cartoons? And it's like, while E. Coyote gets on the rocket, and he's like blasting along, and that's like what it's like writing with my dad. It's like a ride on the rocket. You know, it's unbelievable. Um, uh, you know, I'm, in, in addition to being, you know, uh, uh, one of my closest friends and an amazing dad, um, he's, I think he's one of America's great writers. Um, and, and the chances I've had to work with him have been incredible. Um, I, I, um, I think there's a possibility there might, might be a TV show of The Stand coming, but... But I, I don't have the details. <laughs> but I've, I've read um, the book. I've actually read Heart Shaped Box and, and Horns and, and, and the Wrath comic book as well. And, and they're yeah. wonderful. And, and watching this, the things that stood out most were Bridge and, and then, of course, the map and, you know, seeing yeah. Lock and Key and, and Pennywise. And, and so for you, when you Whoa. saw this stuff, how did it feel seeing it come alive on the screen? Because the bridge was like, it was what I imagined when I read the book. It was just amazing to see it. Yeah, so I grew up in Bangor, Maine, and they, that covered bridge, there used to be this covered, this derelict covered bridge that crossed the Penobscot River. And we used to dare each other to go across it because it was so rickety, it looked like you could fall right through the floorboards and into the river below. And eventually, I think when I was around 13, 14, they tore it down. When I was writing Nosferatu, I, I, that bridge came back to me, and I saw, I saw it as a, a passageway between lost and found. And so I plopped it into the book. And then, you know, fast forward six years, and they, they're making a TV show out of it. And I went to the sound stage where they were filming, and they had the whole bridge in there. And it was, I mean, it's such a trite thing to say. Every writer who sees their story adapted into a film or a TV show seems to say this, but it's true. It was like stepping into my own imagination. And it was also sort of like stepping into my own childhood. Um, so for me, that was one of the most exciting parts of, of visiting the set, and seeing, it, seeing it pulled together. It's been tremendously exciting. And then to see, you know, Zach and Ashley bring these characters to life, the whole cast, you know, um, they've poured a lot of heart into it and um, a lot of passion. And I think it shows over the course of the 10 episodes we've got. Yes, sir. sir. Hi. My uh, name's Kermit. Okay. My Kermit. name's Tim. Um, Joe, Hi, Tim. Joe, first of all, it's good to see you back at WonderCon after a couple mm -hmm. of years. You got a suitcase of comics for me to sign later? No. I know just, this guy. Just a couple <laughs> books. But number two, I wanted to ask the actors and Joe what it was like working together uh, on this. Did, did, uh, did the authors get a lot of feedback from you on, or the characters get a lot of feedback on the characters? Actors, yeah. Uh, Joe has been incredibly supportive of the uh, process and the experience, and it's great to see how excited he is about what we're doing and what we're making. Um, I would say we've probably had more connection, like in promoting the show, than uh, than on set. You know, our relationship with Jamie and uh, our our directors uh, on each episode were kind of the place that we found the 
greatest connection to the characters and to what we're making. Like, we would have a lot of conversations. Um, you know, once something becomes an adaptation, um, and particularly in television, it's really the showrunner's kind of world. Um, so that would, that really was about Jamie's vision and uh, and Joe entrusting Jamie to bring this book to life, and then us looking to Jamie for the guidance that we need to create the characters um, that Joe conceived of. So it's a nice kind of full circle moment where we're all working together, um, but through kinds of filters and, uh, and experiences on set. Joe was barred from set. <laughs> <laughs> um, we did, however, have a 700 page book written by Joe. Um, there all the time. So I feel like um, when he wasn't with us in person, uh, he was definitely all with us in spirit um, and was occasionally with us in person, which was great. This whole thing just seems like a boondoggle for Joe to sell the production copies of his book. You know, like, so. <laughs> I mean, I dropped it now and then to give back the tips. <laughs> yeah, you would. It's true. <laughs> yes, sir. Your name and your question. All right. My name is Walter, and uh, uh, thank you to the panel for being up here to answer these questions. And my uh, question is for Zachary and Olafur, and I'm curious of how you feel uh, as working, is it more demanding to work in TV versus the movies? And which one do you prefer and why? Oh, um, I mean, I prefer theater, frankly. Uh, that's sort of where I feel the most uh, at home. Uh, but in terms of like film and TV and working with cameras, um, they're just, they're different, you know. Movie, you kind of immerse yourself in an experience for a finite amount of time and then you scatter on to the next thing. Whereas in television, you really forge a relationship with a character, with your fellow actors. I mean, you do that with film as well, but you know, it's ongoing with television and that can be a blessing and a curse. I mean, I think some people who are on television series for a long time refer to it as like golden handcuffs, you know, because you have incredible opportunities both creatively and professionally, but then you're also still showing up and doing the same role for sometimes years. Um, so I feel like it's um, it's about the people, really, for me. It, it, it's like if, if you're surrounded by good people who are inspiring and everybody's collaborative and committed and connected as everybody on this stage and everybody back in Providence um, has been, then it's an amazing experience. So for me, it's just a matter of like working with good people and having good material and, uh, and, and staying connected to that. 